All right, we are back for part two of the Birth Stories Uncensored podcast. And we are going to get into my second birth story with my second daughter, Vienna. And if you want to listen to part one, go ahead, because it'll lead very nicely into this. And we asked some great questions. We got into the nitty gritty details, the gross things, the great things, and everything in between. And I think we'll get started. Melissa, do, do you have any questions before we get started with Vienna's? I don't want to like give anything away. I do have a question, but maybe I'll ask half of it and that will lead you into it a, a little bit telling your story. So I I know that with Vienna, you had wanted to do somewhat of like a free birth you wanted to do it by yourself mm -hmm. obviously with the support of a midwife afterwards and I won't let the cat out of the bag on the story of whether or not that happened for you or not but my question and maybe you can get into it psychologically did you feel like that affected you during her birth and because when you end up calling the midwives they they come in a certain window did it give you any sense of rush like oh man I got to get this, got to have this baby before the midwife comes. If I want to like have this thing that I wanted to do, did that mm -hmm. cross your mind? And uh, yeah, maybe start from the beginning and you can touch on my question as you All go. Right. Okay. <laughs> I like that question. I think it's okay if I answer it because I don't think it affected me. Similar to my first birth experience, I kind of just in the moment, I don't think I had a lot of time to think about that. And I also like let go of the of a lot of the expectations that I had set. Vienna's birth, I will say, was like a little bit more chaotic, a lot more chaotic than Valencia's birth. For some context, the pregnancy was very different. With Valencia's pregnancy, I just felt like, remember when we talked about body image? I yes. felt like so feminine, you know, like so curvy and voluptuous and like, just so in awe of how my body was moving and shifting. And I did have some like hip discomfort, but I did the kinesiology taping on my belly with the chiropractor that I worked in the clinic with. And so, so that was really helpful. I felt super supported by the midwives with Valencia. They answered all my questions. And yeah, her pregnancy, besides being really tired in the first trimester, was fairly good and also just feeling like pain if I had a large meal because towards the end there wasn't a lot of space for much food in my in my stomach but with Vienna I was in a very different headspace it was the pandemic my relationship with my partner was was very different at that point I had a toddler so when it's your first pregnancy and you still have the freedom to go where you want to go do what you want to do we went on a baby moon trip we went to England when I was like six months pregnant right it was just all the celebration and all the things right yeah but with Vienna we couldn't go anywhere because of the pandemic I don't think we would have gone anywhere because of my headspace I think I experienced pre-partum depression and anxiety and then it lifted, I think, like around 27 weeks, something like that. But I was crying like all the time, literally Is that anything. a thing, prepartum depression? Yeah. I didn't I've never heard of that. Yeah, yeah. That's so interesting. I guess your hormones are just as crazy before as after, so it makes sense. But I've just never heard of that before. That's so interesting. For context as well, like my partner was... I was seeing a lot of the signs because like as a naturopath, I can, I think I've been trained to like see where things are going because my mind works as like preventative medicine, right? And so I was seeing a lot of the signs of my partner's addiction and like, and where that could lead, you know, like yeah. his liver, his poor liver. Like I was just so worried and like, don't leave me with like two girls to raise on my own kind of thing. Yeah. And so I think there was a reason for all of the anxiety and depression. And my mom was going through cancer treatment at the time. So it was not a surprise. Sure, my hormones were all pregnancy, crazy hormones, but also yeah. my life circumstances not surprisingly impacted it, right? 
and the world. Like the pandemic had changed so many things, like the way we we move. It caused and... issues with so many people with their mental health and everything. So I'm not surprised yeah. that it would have an effect when you're mm-hmm. all pregnancy crazy with on top of everything else you had going on. So you can't right? buy it honestly. It's what I'm trying to say. But it did surprise me because I, it was so different from my first pregnancy. So right. again, I thought it was going to be a boy because it felt so different. But <laughs> no, but because everything was so uncertain, like with the world and in my life, I wanted to know the gender. I wanted something to be certain that I could like hold on to. Like I know the gender, I can pick the clothes, like all these things. Right. So typically I'm someone who's like very okay, not knowing, but I really wanted like to hold on to something with certainty. So I was very happy to know the gender of Vienna ahead of time. But you didn't tell anybody. No, we didn't. Yeah. Because after she was born, I I remember you guys sending us a text and you didn't have a name yet because you didn't name her forever. And (laughs) I was just like, I think it's a boy because there's something that you'd said to us. And then we went over and we found out she was actually a girl. So yeah, <laughs> we yeah. thought she was a boy too. I think we, we kept the gender to ourselves. I'm pretty sure we did that. Yeah. But it was nice for me to know at least. And funny enough, Valencia, she was like two and a bit when I got pregnant. She's the one who told me that I was pregnant. Yes. Yeah, I was changing. I was changing her before bed. And she points at my stomach and she goes, mommy, baby, tummy. I'm like, what? (laughs) She's like, mommy, baby, tummy. I'm like, there's a baby in my tummy. And she's like, "Uh huh? I'm like, oh, is it a boy or a girl? She said boy. And then a week later, she started saying girl, but I held on to boy. I was like, it's a boy. (laughs) She was right. We tested it and she was right. I'm like, she predicts she's a psychic. So yeah. So there was a lot leading up to the birth throughout the pregnancy that I think probably there was like an definitely an energy of chaos, let's say. So leading up to the birth, so she, there were some interesting coincidences with, with her birth and like what I had on hand. I had visited a friend who I hadn't seen in a while because of the pandemic um, a week before her due date. So in my mind, I was like, okay, Valencia came like a few days early. She'll probably come like a little bit early as well. But I wasn't expecting like a whole week early. Yeah. So a few things weren't done. Like I I didn't prepare popsicles. But that friend that I saw, she had a box. I think she only used one of the Freedom Mom popsicles. So it's like... Mm -hmm. You don't have to have them in the freezer. You can have them by your bedside and you just like crack crack them. them. I've seen them. Yeah. I had them. I didn't use them. (laughs) Amazing. Like I would never make patsicles again. They were so good. (laughs) Like I didn't have to go downstairs to the freezer. I could just leave them in my bathroom and so easy. And then like you could spray on like a, you know, a soothing botanical, whatever. Like a chasel situation or something. Yeah. Yeah. So So I was really happy. That was like a a nice coincidence. So I visited her. We were talking about uh, the due date and such. And then I actually went into labor that evening after seeing her. So she gave me like a bunch of onesies that she wasn't using. And she gave me the, the Freedom Mom pads. And I feel like she gave me something else. So it was like, I just happened to have these goodies on hand before going into labor. So because it was a week, ahead I had the hospital bag but I hadn't like fully packed it the way that I had ready for Valencia Um, but I did have all of the home birth supplies in place and and we had the bed sheets ready to switch over I remember when I went into labor with Vienna I felt like I got punched in the vagina and I woke up from my sleep at like (laughs) at like one in the morning maybe even beforehand, like maybe like 1245. That was very different because with Valencia, it was like more like menstrual cramp, like heaviness kind of thing. But I woke up because I felt like someone punched me in the vagina. And then I started leaking. And by the time I got to the bathroom, like the tile floor, there was a gush. I'm like, oh, this is interesting. Oh, so that's like how I was woken up from sleep with my movie gush. Yeah, 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 totally. <laughs> That's weird. That's interesting how you describe it getting punched. I wouldn't describe mine as being punched. Maybe it was more like a, 
<laughs> yeah. A kick, like maybe it was a leg. I don't know. It felt like very, like a piercing pain. Oh, interesting. Yeah. Like a I didn't have any pain. Piercing. It was an interesting sensation to get woke yeah. up. Yeah. So because I had had some experience with Valencia, I definitely had more confidence. I've done this. I, I have experience. You kind of know what to expect a little bit more the second yeah. time than the first of time. Course. And, and so I had toyed around with the idea of a free birth because I had heard Laura Shanley on a podcast. She's come on the podcast and she's kind of like the unassisted birth pioneer. And now it's more so called like free birthing or sovereign birthing. And this idea just really was interesting to me, you know, and because I'm a type of the type of person that wants to birth very like undisturbed and like not with a lot of people around me. I was like, that's really cool. And, and last time the midwife asked me if I wanted to catch Valencia. Right. If she felt like I could, then, then maybe I can with Vienna. Maybe I can try it. So all these ideas were kind of running through my, my mind. But there was at one point that I had a gestational diabetes scare, I would say. My first blood test came back a little bit high. Mm. I did have a Lara bar, which is like all dates before the yeah. test. <laughs> with my so second test, it. I was like the first time I'd gone because I also failed my first with my first daughter, my first yeah. gestational diabetes test because I had eaten a bagel right before I had gone. So the next <laughs> yeah. time I ate nothing that was going to spike my blood sugar. <laughs> totally. I did not want to go yeah. for the follow up test where you have to sit there for three hours. No, no. Don't eat a Lara bar or a bagel. That's the don't, message we're sending. Don't do that. Yeah. <laughs> like have like an egg or yes. something like that. Yeah. And so the second time I didn't have anything that would spike my blood sugar and, and I was okay. But it did give me a little bit of a sense of like, I don't know if things are going to go as smoothly this time, you know? Mm -hmm. So I really had to tune in. And I knew that I was like much more stressed this time than I was the first time. So it was like maybe like my stress levels and like cortisol are impacting things and, and maybe it might not go as smoothly. But I will say that I started listening to hypnobirthing tracks like almost as soon as I found out that I was pregnant. So I was, I was still like retraining and rewiring my brain quite a bit throughout the pregnancy. So just a very different experience overall. And then going back to feeling like I got kicked and then having that gush of fluid. And I was like, okay, this is like the, another way that your water can break. And then it felt like very quickly I wanted to, like there was no time to like pretend that I was gonna have some sleep. So I went in, in into a little bit of a mode of like, okay, what do I do? I know this is gonna be swift because if Valencia was four hours, this is probably going to be like, three or two hours, right? So I was like, where do I focus my attention? The hospital bag isn't packed yet. So I actually started like kind of packing the hospital bag a little bit. Mm -hmm. And then things started getting more intense. So I was like, F that, that went out the window. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, maybe I go to the dilation station right away. So I let Richard know that things were happening. And we called we called the midwife, but we were still kind of in a calm state at that point. We were like, we mm -hmm. will probably need a midwife in the next couple of hours or so. And we were so calm on the phone that I mm -hmm. think their perception was we're in this for the long haul. Yeah. And, it, and like, they it always the assume they're in it for the long haul. Yeah. Yeah. Like, when did it start? Like, oh, it just started 20 minutes ago. We've got so much time. Right. Not the case. Not the case. So I chose to like go to the toilet and use the dilation station again. And I was like rocking side to side and the mucus plug was coming out. The other stuff, the poopy stuff was coming out. There was lots of blood coming out. And I just kept rocking side to side. And if anyone watches this on video in the future, I'm rocking side to side right now, thinking yeah. about it, remembering yeah. it. <laughs> I remember getting, I was like, okay, because environment is so important to me, right? I lit the candles, I got the essential oil diffuser going. And then I remember Richard bringing up his massive construction worker boom box. And I was <laughs> like, get that shit out of here. <laughs> I'm using my tiny, very efficient little beats pill. I didn't put on any songs. 
in particular, I just put on kind of like a relaxing, calm meditation soundtrack. Ooh, I forgot to mention with Valencia's birth that she happened to be born to a Pearl Jam song called Release Me. No, you did mention it. That. Yeah, yeah. Okay. You didn't mention that it was, it was Pearl Jam, but you did mention the song because I brought up, brought up all the symbolic songs that you had during your first birth. You can't always control it, but if you like happen to have any way of bringing in a song that you're really vibing with while your baby is being born the pro of that is that you can always like me and Valencia will be in the car and I'll be like hey your your birth song is on and we'll just jam out to it it's just a nice thing for her to always be like I was born to this song you know yeah Vienna does not have a birth song I can pick something from that like meditation playlist and pretend that she has a birth song <laughs> right? <laughs> but but yeah so I put on music I lit the candles I had the essential oil diffuser going and then I, with the little ounce of strength that I had went from the toilet right to the bathtub because it like the the intensity that I was experiencing went from like zero to 100 really really fast so I just yeah. mustered up enough energy to put myself in the bathtub. I was like, I don't care if it's too early. I'm doing this right now. I need the water. So yeah. I turned on the water. I got myself into the zone. I remember having, I happened to have coconut water. So I got that and I was just sipping on coconut water the whole time. I think we had like cashews. I don't, I don't think I had a lot of time to munch, but those really helped after Vienna was born. And things went so fast that I remember at one point, because of that same shock of intensity, I thought to myself, like, I don't know if I could do this. And that's yeah. usually transition, right? When yeah. women doubt their ability, like you're yes. like, go into that threshold of the limits of your capacity and meeting that part of you that thinks you know what to expect and then pushes you over that cliff. I went there and you have no choice, really, like when you're at that point. And at this point, yeah. are you still within like an hour? Yeah. Yeah. I had to yeah. put some context in the time here for everyone. It's not like two hours yeah. has passed. No. We're within an very, hour from water gushing to we're in the tub. Very, very like swift. Everything was happening so quickly. And, and so I knew the midwives were on the way. A part of me really wanted this like free birth experience. But the chaos of everything, I really had to surrender. You know how we always talk about that idea of surrender? Yeah. So many things felt like they were out of my control. And I just had to surrender. I just had to lean in. And I called my mom. Sorry, I called my mom actually before I got into the bathtub. And I remember people pleasing again. I remember apologizing to her because it was in the middle of the night, you know, like my mom's going through chemo and stuff. And I was like, I'm so sorry, but I don't think you can wait until the morning to come. I needed her to come and just be with Valencia in case Valencia woke up. Yeah. And like caused chaos, which looking back now, I'm like, it's not bad to have your other kids attend. No, your birth, she probably you know? just would have sat beside you. She's so sweet yeah. and calm. Yeah. But at the time, I think I was afraid it would like get me out of the zone too much because yeah. I'd be like worried yeah. about her and like having to soothe her and stuff. My mom was on the way and going back to me in the bathtub in that moment of transition when I'm like, I don't even know if I can do this and like getting pushed to the limits of my capacity. And Richard at that point came back into the bathroom. He's like, I think we need to call someone. I think I need to go get someone. And I'm like, if you leave, you're going to miss this. It yeah. was like just that knowing of like, yeah. do not go. You're going to miss this. Don't leave and again. Sure, <laughs> and the water was not as high. Like I didn't feel it as high for some reason, but it was like just the right amount to feel like a little bit of buoyancy. And so right in that moment when I was like, if you leave, you're going to miss this. I remember there was another surge another wave so much intensity and I just picked her up she was born so fast I just picked her up and I put her on my chest and I looked at Richard and I was just like oh my god <laughs> like no no tears nothing but I was just like just in shock of yeah. what had occurred it was bananas to me yeah. and and Vienna 
had her eyes open right away. I put her on my belly and she started to do the breast crawl right away. And so going back to Sarah, Dr. Sarah Buckley's podcast, there is this like surge of cortisol for the infant too. And, Mm -hmm. and I think for her, like, that's kind of what gave her this like alertness and like the ability to do the breast crawl so fast. And so I just laid her on my belly. She did the breast crawl. She latched literally right away. (laughs) And she was just looking around from side to side. Her eyes were wide open and her (laughs) eyes were like darting from side to side, like checking out the world that she had just been born into. She probably had like undergone like minimal stress too, right? Like uh, for babies who are navigating this process for like so many hours, it's got to be tiring on them too, right? But she was just like, I'm out. Yeah. Let's do it. <laughs> you know? Hello, world. Totally. Yeah. You must have blown Richard's mind uh, in that moment. But, like, do you think, how do you think the speed of that, like, affected you? Did you feel like it was just, like, so, like, overwhelming? My sister's baby didn't come that fast, but it came pretty fast, her, her second kid. And she just talks about it like it was terrible. It was like she'd had all these expectations and, because it, it, everything happened so fast, like she wasn't able to get the epidural that she didn't want, uh, she, or sort of that she she did, she did want, and so she just like I don't know, it's like she was I guess sent into some kind of a, a frenzy by the the speed of which her baby came. Do you feel like mm-hmm. the speed did it have an effect on you? Did did it overwhelm you to go from zero to a hundred, even mm-hmm. psychologically, not having this moment to like ease into the idea? Okay, baby's coming now. It's like oh, she's coming now. Looking back. I think timing wise, I was happy that it was like just me and Richard when it occurred. But I think I would have preferred like another hour. Right. You know, to like really get into a zone. Yeah. Whereas I probably was in the zone, not chaos mode for like 20 minutes. Right. Otherwise, my brain was in like a bit of a like frenzy and that you talk about like that frenetic energy. Yeah. And that just echoed like fr- literally from like the pregnancy, the beginning of the pregnancy to the postpartum period, including our midwife. So let's talk about the midwife that showed. So the midwife bit. misses this birth. I'm sure she's in a frenzy. <laughs> she was in. She brought more of that like chaotic energy to the yeah. whole experience. And so my mom ended up showing up, she ended up missing the exit on the highway and showing up seven minutes afterwards. And she walks in the door and apparently Richard's like, she's here. And she's like, who's here? <laughs> He's like, she's here. The baby's here. And, and then the midwives very shortly followed after my mom arrived. But it was so lovely. Let me pause and just say how lovely it was to have my mom come into that moment I'm still in the bath Vienna was latched on and like for her to meet her her granddaughter in such a calm setting it was it was a really like lovely moment to have with my mom and and then the the midwives showed up and it was yeah she came in I was gonna say leave it to a mom to beat the midwives I know of course (laughs) so so when the midwife came in she was in a frenzy because she had another client that same night who delivered in a car so she had she had like just missed two two births and I think was like running around very frantically trying to support like her other client and me at the same time and so when she came in it was I I felt like almost I had to like regulate her and like soothe her (laughs) You know, instead of like the support being towards me. And and then she asked me to drain the water, which in like the podcast about Valencia's birth, I was like, it was so nice for the midwife to just be like, she's obviously not hemorrhaging. Like we don't need to make her uncomfortable right now. So she asked me to drain the water to assess for hemorrhage. And I wasn't, but it did leave me like naked and cold in the bathtub without any like buoyancy. And so I was very uncomfortable. And then, and then I did end up getting up, but it wasn't the midwives who helped me. My mom actually helped me get out of the bathtub. (laughs) It was very interesting. She did actually help me to birth the placenta. 
but she asked me to cough and I did, I complied, but, but I didn't do that the first time. So I, I felt very much like it was like a, a guided birth of the placenta. Whereas mm-hmm. with my first, it was, it was like, just like breathe it out. Just the same way you, you like breathed out your baby pretty much. Just like let your body do what it needs to do. And so, yeah, that was a different experience with the placenta. But the cool thing is that we left the placenta intact like with the umbilical cord to Vienna. And, and that was interesting because like there are different definitions of a lotus birth, but, but having everything intact and, and, and birth at the same time is one definition. Mm -hmm. And so we gave Vienna the middle name of Lotus because of that. That was a nice moment just to just experience that. So I came out of the bathtub. I believe I asked, to shower I'm not sure don't remember that anymore (laughs) that memory's gone (laughs) I remember no I did I did ask to shower actually so I did shower I got into my PJs they were assessing Vienna while I was doing that weighing her they did say her temperature was a bit low a few times but it was kind of like cold in our in our bedroom so that could have been why and then we just kind of like laid in bed and hung out and got to know Vienna. My mom was there and that was really nice. And then Valencia was still sleeping from what I remember. The next morning when Valencia woke up, it was interesting to see her reaction to her little sister because she walked in the room and she was like, oh, she's so cute. Poke, poke. (laughs) And actually (laughs) said the word poke as she poked her. Poke. It was like a really cute meeting between them. That is so cute. You know what I think of when I think of your your second birth is you had all these tools like at your house on your dining room table. And I was like, (laughs) what? (laughs) You had kept all these things. I don't know that the midwife had brought. And I was like, what is going on? (laughs) I remember that. Yeah. Richard wanted to keep the surgical tools for some reason. Yeah, which does lead me to say that I I had like a micro tear the second time. They didn't have to stitch me up or anything. Amazing. So I didn't do the whole like spread eagle on my bed right. to welcome people to the house. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Fast but and furious. I do remember that we kept the tools. I think I still have them. So there you go. If you ever need some tools, <laughs> you got them in the closet. I will say it was it was cool to experience like a quote unquote free birth. But it was, there was this like energy of, of chaos, but then like a big sense of empowerment that I could, I could do it and my, my body could do it. And I was able even within the chaos to surrender to the chaos, you know what I mean? And like collect myself and kind of like lead the experience in a way. I know we're, we're going to change the title of the podcast, but I felt in both experiences very much like a CEO, like. If I had a need, I wanted it met. For the most part, I was unapologetic. And I just had so much clarity about discerning the next step. There was that moment of like, should I pack the hospital bag or should I do this? And very quickly, it was like, no, like, let's just like go to the dilation station. No, let's just get in the tub. There was a lot of clarity about the next step. And, and as things unfolded, I, I pivoted and I adapted really quickly. And yeah, there was this and like so, authority, authority, like an inner authority that I was like, I'm connected to this inner part of me that just knows what to do. Yeah. So on that note, you're talking about like, and I'm filling the tub and I'm like lighting the candles. Like, is this, is this you doing this? Or are you like, Richard, light me some candles and fill the tub. No, I'm doing it. You're doing it? I don't understand. Yeah. What, what is Richard doing? I don't know. I don't remember too much, but he's doing stuff. I'm like, you're he's walking around with the lighter <laughs> in full-on labor, lighting your own candles. Like, come on. This. From what I recall, because like, as you know, what you recall could be different than like what actually took place, right? But from what I recall in both experiences, I lit the candles. I, I, I remember, remember plugging in the essential oil diffuser, putting on the music. In the first one, Richard put on the music because he used his big like construction worker boombox, <laughs> and and I filled up the tub, and 
I think Richard got me the coconut water and some snacks and he was calling people. I think he's the one who called the midwife. Because the first time you yeah. were like on the phone and then you yeah. had also called your mom and I'm like, yeah, where is this guy? <laughs> Dig it out the yeah. boom box. <laughs> and I was like, get that out of here. <laughs> I don't want to see that thing. I will say like the, how I felt afterwards was interesting because like in typical common labors that are like quite prolonged, you know, like you sweat, you're tired, you're exhausted, you're, you're going through so many things, but because there was such a short duration, I yeah. was feeling pretty fresh. Yeah. You know? <laughs> I just I showered my body. <laughs> yeah. So I remember just getting in and I don't know if you experienced this, but like that flush of hormones that come afterwards, like you feel that sense of glow. So when I look back at pictures of me in the bathtub and on the bed holding Vienna, I'm like, oh, it looks so feminine. There's this like <laughs> goddess glow. <laughs> you have this like you're batting your eyelashes at the camera. <laughs> and, and so that, so Vienna was born in the middle of the night. I think she was born just after two, like 2.07 a.m. And then the following evening, uh, my family came over and we just kind of, everyone saw her and met her and, and I got some support. I remember my aunt and Richard making some chicken soup. All I wanted for a long time afterwards, looking into traditional Chinese medicine and Ayurveda and my like Mediterranean culture is like chicken soup. And she was born right at the beginning of fall, at the end of September. And mm -hmm that that season calls for those very easily digestible, very nourishing foods. And no matter what season you give birth in, that's what your body needs, like the, the broths and the soups and things that are just so easy to digest, but very nutrient dense and are going to yeah. help to heal your tissues, like the collagen and all of that Stock stuff. Stock your fridge. Stock your freezer mm -hmm. with the goodies. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Definitely. Yeah. And that's not all the, I was Not craving. the treat goodies, the nutrient goodies. Yeah, yeah. Not with the cake. I was craving those foods. My body knew what it needed. And I don't know about you, but with breastfeeding, my caloric intake like skyrocketed. And I was craving foods that like in the middle of the night when I'm never normally hungry. Right? Well, I feel like it's still skyrocketed. So I yeah, just feel like all day I'm like, I just want to eat all the food. You do when you're breastfeeding, like your body is processing all these calories that you're taking in, like turning them into food for your yeah. little one. I read something like that. It was like doing th like one breastfeeding session was like the equivalent of like calorie burn. I'm doing like three hours of yoga or something I, because I kept getting tired after I nurse her. And, mm. and I went to my husband and I was like, maybe this is why <laughs> maybe I'm tired because it's like I just did three hours of yoga. <laughs> yeah. Totally. Like your body's burning through those calories, and like making it into something digestible and nutrient dense yeah. for this like little person. Yeah. Yeah. I was hungry all the time, all the time. But overall, like what I take from both experiences is like, I was definitely pushed to a limit of what I feel I could handle sensation wise. And like for my first experience, very shocked by that. For my second experience, shocked in a different way. Like it was, I almost felt like, oh, I, I thought I could do this at one point. Like, but can I do this? Because you do kind of forget how we were talking about. You do kind of forget what yeah. it actually feels like. I felt that sense the second time of like, can I even do this? and having to surrender to that part of you that doubts yourself and and also to all the things you can't control. I couldn't have controlled the mood that my midwife was in. I you couldn't can't control, control when she arrives. <laughs> yeah, there's so much that you can't control and that you have to simply surrender to and pivot and and do what feels best for you. And I'm glad that the free birth, I should say this, I'm glad that that went through my mind and that I wanted that, that I was leaning towards that. And I did want like the aftercare of the midwives because I find it so valuable that they come to your house and they, and they take care of you and they check on yeah. you and, and on baby. But had I not thought about that, I think 
that could have been a traumatic experience, right? Had I planned a hospital birth, and I did have Carrie Stevens on the podcast who had an unplanned home birth for her third, and Mm -hmm. she describes that as a traumatic experience. So I think that was a, a happy coincidence because I felt like I can do this. I had mentally prepared for it in a way. I can catch her. And I can you secretly this. manifested it. I do think I secretly manifested it, but there was still that sense of like chaos that I yes. wasn't ex- expecting. Well, right? it's just because it happened too fast. I think we've talked about this before. The expectation can be the difference between like a quote unquote traumatic experience versus someone else that might have the same experience, but thinks that things went swiftly well. Totally. I think it a hundred percent comes down to your expectation. Like I was saying with my sister, she had an expectation that she was going to go to the hospital. She was going to get her epidural. And then they were like, you're too far along. There's no point in giving you an epidural. Like you're there. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. And so having this one expectation in mind and having another outcome, I think it really throws people for a loop threw me for a loop in my first birth experience. I, you know, and I'd love to be with like my, I have another sister. She's very freewheeling. She's like, whatever happens, happens. It's all good. And I don't know that anything could face her. She's, she's like, just doesn't care, you know? And I don't know how to <laughs> teach someone that level of like absolute surrender to whatever happens. But yeah. if I could say anything, like just release all expectations because like you never know what to expect the truth Mm -hmm. of the matter is you just don't you can plan Mm -hmm. and plan and plan but you can't rely on what you expect to happen it's not likely to happen (laughs) in birth birth, it can in many things really in many yeah in life you totally but birth is just this like amplification of so many so many things that we experience in life I did want to touch upon that expectation part because I I do feel like if I was freaking out and like just focusing on packing the hospital bag right or if you were just like oh no I gotta wait till the midwife comes I can't do it you know like you had that mindset you might be just totally freaking out totally and I would find yourself in that situation you don't need to freak out you can do it anyone listening you don't have to be in a state of fear you can do it in the car, in the elevator, in your bathtub, in sometimes, a birthing pool, in the hospital. <laughs> sometimes I, it, I, my mom was like, be careful what you say. Because I was like, I kind of secretly wanted to like, have my baby in the car on the way to the hospital. Because then <laughs> I didn't have to go to the hospital. I didn't have to plan a home birth. I didn't have to go to the hospital. I could just like secretly have my baby on the side of the road in the car. Some people probably think I'm crazy right now thinking like, really? That's kind of what you were secretly hoping for? And I was like, kind of. <laughs> Didn't happen. Yeah. But, you know, I thought, you know, yeah. if that happens, I could be okay with it. Yeah. And if it did happen, you probably would have been in a great mood. I'd probably been like, hey, it happened. That to happen. <laughs> yeah. Someone who definitely didn't want to give a car, like like my midwife's other client that night. Right, to each their own, right? Yeah, so that's the thing with birth is like letting go of expectation, fully surrendering, and whatever happens, being being okay with that. It happens as it happens. It unfolds as it's, as it's going to unfold. And I always say, as much as the mother has to prepare and give birth, it is your baby's birthday and they are a big part of this experience and a part that we often don't take into consideration that they are also doing the work and they are signaling to the mother and the mother is responding to those signals and they're going to come out how they want, where they want, when they want. On their and terms. On their terms. And so being this, this vessel for them and and doing I think you and Tim said this on your be back podcast is like you can do all the things that will give them the best chance of a certain type of birth that you're aiming for but they're kind of in control they're the captain really yeah they might be they really might be (laughs) and they continue 
to be that secret <laughs> little captain who drives the ship once they're out. That might be another podcast topic where we talk about child-centered parenting versus parent-centered parenting. We've talked yeah. a little bit about siesta, uh, siesta styles. Not Spanish siesta nights. styles. Yeah, yeah, Spanish nights. The parents are going to hang out and they can go to bed whenever they feel like going to bed. But it can work against you in a lot of ways. It can. It can. Do you have any other questions about Vienna's quote unquote free birth? I I don't. I just wanted to know if it had sort of psychologically affected you during that process, but it sounds like the whole thing was chaotic. So maybe slightly it did. And I just want to know if the overall speed of it had an effect on you, but we went through that. And Mm -hmm. yeah, I mean, I feel like you did say. Because I asked you about Valencia, if there was any point at which you were like, you felt like you made the wrong decision to like have a home birth and you were kind of like, ah, and like not with this one, like I was really confident, but maybe with Vienna. Did you touch mm-hmm. on that? I feel like you I might not have said. I don't think so. But I think what I meant was that moment of like, can I do this? Mm. You know, like, can I actually do this? Whereas with Valencia, I don't feel like I had that moment. I was shocked by the intensity, but right. I don't think I had a moment of like, can I do this? Is this okay? But also because the midwife's not there, like you're by yourself and yeah. 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 It was definitely very different, but I did want to touch upon the birth story processing that, that event that we did. And so from the outside, Vienna's birth and for me as well, like Vienna's birth was great. It was fast. It was what I had secretly manifested. It has It was what I desired. Things went quite well. But when I went over it during the birth story processing experience, there were a lot of points that were sticky for me that I had to process. And surprisingly, a lot of it wasn't much to do with Vienna's birth. It was the midwife, like those points where I I wish I just said like, no, I'm not going to drain the water. I'm quite comfortable right now. Right. Mm -hmm. And, and with my partner. So you never know what's going to be the sticky part for you during the experience. So I think, I think expanding and again, coming back to that message of who attends your birth really matters. And so thinking about that as much as you can, but there's a lot that we don't control. And I would say, I think just like looking back on my experiences, those sticky moments tend to be those ones where you didn't take a stand for yourself in the moment you kind of knew you should. And then Mm -hmm. you didn't. And then you're like, oh, like I should have said that or I should have done that. And and you knew Mm -hmm. it at the time, but you were either so like in the zone or distracted or there was just something going on that you just, you, you didn't take that, that like little stand for yourself in that moment or just push that little bit on something that you you knew you like wanted or needed and so I feel like that's always like the little things that stick with you so moral of the story Mm -hmm. is see what you need get it yeah be the CEO of your own birth experience as we say sometimes yeah (laughs) okay so finally I talked about my second birth experience on a podcast all about birth And I'm happy I did because every time that we share our experiences, there's a little bit of healing, there's wisdom that gets passed on, there's so much learning that we can do from mom to mom, family to family with every experience, and just sharing all the parts. Like, there are a lot of gross parts of labor and birth, but it's also very beautiful and amazing and so empowering and sometimes disempowering and we sharing sharing the stories just brings us closer together and and builds this community even more so thank you thank you melissa for listening and asking and all the things and thank you for sharing i feel like i learned things i didn't even know today it was awesome until the next episode of birth uncensored i'm making a (laughs) dramatic face because sometimes we record on video and so You might not be able to see me, but I'm dancing dramatically. (laughs) (laughs) I love it. Goodbye, everyone.